So I welcome you to my 11th entry into my series on the book of Romans. And we have now successfully made it into chapter three. So we are slowly progressing, which is a good thing. Now, as a recap of chapter two, the first part of the chapter dealt with the admonition from Paul that our boast should be in the Lord. And then ending out the chapter, Paul rebukes the Jewish leaders over their false works view regarding circumcision. So let's jump into chapter three, verse one, which reads, what advantage then has the Jew or what is the profit of circumcision? Key point here. So in a sense here, Paul is pretty much diminishing the prideful arrogance that the religious Jews carried around with them, clinging to this notion that we are the true Jews because we've been circumcised. But Paul recants that by declaring that to God, Jews and Gentiles are determined not by the circumcision of the flesh, but by something else. So let's continue into verse two, which reads, much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. Key point here. So what's interesting about this verse is that it brings to light the enormous privilege that the Jewish people have received. Paul declares that they have been entrusted with the oracles of God. Now, the word oracle in this sense means that the Jews had been chosen as a medium by which God would send forth his grace to the whole world. So let's continue in verse three. For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief, will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Key point here. So we see here that Paul is posing rhetorical questions to the Jews in an attempt to change their thinking, okay, an attempt to bring them to repentance. Paul asks the question, what if the Jews who had been circumcised were unfaithful? What Paul is basically alluding to is the fact that circumcision of the flesh isn't enough, okay, that you can that you can't and will lose your soul unless you receive the circumcision of the heart. He's referring to regeneration here. So often in this world, we have religious people that are clinging to some work as though it will be sufficient before God on the day of judgment. Okay, So many people think works will get them to heaven. Now, the truth is, it is the Lord Jesus Christ who finished the work on that cross and only him. Okay, And it is only the work that the Lord fulfilled on that cross that will be sufficient on the day of judgment. That is why Jesus Christ is the only suitable propitiate for our sins, because he was the only one to keep the law perfectly. And even though Jesus was circumcised, as Luke 2.21 tells us, his true circumcision was his death, burial, and resurrection on our behalf. So let's continue in verse 4. Certainly not, indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your works and may overcome when you are judged. So let's go ahead and stop here for today. And I hope that I have explained it in a way that you can understand. If not, hit, me, hit my email and let's talk about it. So thank you again for this. Now, let's go on. Being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. I wish I had the quote. There was one old Puritan who would say this. That there are some words that should not be mentioned except with a trembling lip. Redemption is one of those words. Redemption. What does it mean? It's to purchase something. Purchase a slave, a captive, a prisoner by the making of a payment. Now that in itself is amazing. But really, what adds the amazement to this is the price that was paid. The blood of God's own Son. the blood of God's own Son. There's a video out there and it's kind of growing in popularity and it's well done, but it's bad theology. You see this prisoner represents the sinner and he's chained to a wall. And you see, as the narrator's speaking, you see this shadow come toward him. And all you can see is the shadow has its arm raised up and has a whip. And it looks like he's about to beat the, uh, the prisoner to death. But then in this video, all of a sudden, the Son of God, or what is supposed the Son of God, intercedes and puts himself in the middle and takes the lash of the whip in the place of the sinner. And in the film, in the documentary, or whatever it is, the little film, it is the devil that's holding the whip that's about to beat the sinner. And it is the devil who lays the whip across Christ's back to save the sinner from the devil. 
Well, Origen had a similar problem with his theology. That Christ was a payment paid to the devil to save us from the imprisonment of the devil. Make no mistake, Christ's death saves His people from enslavement to the devil, but not in that way at all. And if you think so, you are in the realm of heresy. It wasn't Satan that had the whip. It was God. 